What can people who are interested in erotic power play learn from anarchists, and what can anarchists learn from them? I'm here with Andy Isenson, um, and I'm Kathy Martilli from the IntimacyDojo.com. And Andy, you're going to be talking about no daddies, no masters, DS, and power play as as anarchists and access intimacy at Woodhall Sexual Freedom Summit, which I love. It's a very interesting topic, and I think. Um, power dynamics is such a key topic right now in general, and I'm really curious, how are you, in, you know, I, I'm not sp super kicky, but my understanding was like, isn't BDSM very hierarchical and you're supposed to have power dynamics? Like, how do you play with that? I'm really curious. Well, so, uh, hi, Kathy. I'm really, I'm really glad to be doing this with you. Um, and um, I'm very excited to be talking about, uh, about this stuff. Uh, at, at Woodhull because it's something that I spend a lot of time recreationally talking about um, and talking about with my partners and friends um, and, and trying to figure out, you know, what does it look like to be engaging with power in our personal lives and in the world yeah. in the way that we do um, and how do we, how do we do that in a way that's ethical, that's consistent with our politics um, and that also is a good time for everyone involved. Yeah. Um, you know, and and when we're dealing with relational power in interpersonal relationships, there's a lot of power going in a lot of different directions at all times. There's society. Um, there's political. There, like it, it's and that's one of the complexities of it for me. Like when I'm trying to figure out how much power I have in a given situation, I don't know what the other person's perception is, and like where are we all playing? So, sorry, just like absolutely, it's very nuanced. And, and uh, and it's never it's never one directional and it's never linear, mm -hmm. um, you know. So I think a lot of people like to try to simplify the conversation about power and yeah. say, well, this person has more privilege than that person, and so that person, uh, and, so, and so has to listen to them and obey whatever they say, you know, and try to make it this very simple of like who has the authority, who's in charge, um, and who needs to sit down and shut up. Yeah. And I'm really interested in complicating that idea because uh, none of none of these none of the ideas of power and privilege um, you know as they were actually initially posited have ever been that simple and it's really it's really appealing to try to make them simple in that way yeah. because it sure would be nice if the world were a simple place it, um, it, well, it is but I've heard it mostly described as in groups like men white cis men as a group have more power than white cis women who have more power than black men for cis men like and there's like but within each of those groups i'm i work in corporate so i'm a white cis woman and there's not many of us there's a lot more men male identified people and cis identified um and yet i'm more powerful i know i identify as more powerful than some of the men and not as powerful as a lot of them but there's like it's like to say as a group all you're a brick and this is you're all fit into that doesn't really work right it's not it's not actually useful it's just comforting yes um, and so and so i'm really interested in complicating the conversation around power and and relational power and systemic power yeah um and i think a, a really useful two really useful tools for doing that are Yes, power play, um, mm -hmm. ways of relating with power in a way that's intentional and negotiated as practice or relating with power in an intentional and negotiated way in the larger world rather yeah. than just during sex. Yeah. And anarchist politics, which are about a bottom-up politic that springs out of mutual care and mutual aid rather than trying to create hierarchy because hierarchy makes things easier. You know, I think about, um, I, I grew up working in a barn um, and uh, and working with horses. Yeah. And one of the one of the things that I, I really strongly remember about horses is that they really want hierarchy. Yeah. Um, if a horse doesn't know their place in the hierarchy of the herd, like when a new horse comes in or if they're in a new place, it's chaotic. They really stuffed out um, because they really need to know who to listen to. Mm -hmm. um, but like we are not herd animals. Mm -hmm. We are interdependent, autonomous animals. Yeah. Um, and that's really different. We're so we um, need we need other humans. We're social. Right. We certainly need connection. Um, but when we when we have access to the power that we as humans deserve, mm -hmm. um, power with and not power over. You know what I mean? Yeah. Then 
we don't actually need hierarchy because we can identify what to do collectively rather than hierarchically. Um, and so transforming the way that we deal with power in the world by transforming the way that we deal with power in our personal lives. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we practice having power consensually, negotiatedly, and based in mutual care and aid mm -hmm. uh, in DS in order to more effectively implement that same interaction with power as we move through the world. Yeah, I, I get that. I've done role playing and therapy where we're kind of trying on roles and seeing how they feel and where we might be uncomfortable and talking about the discomfort or whatever. So is that similar to what you're like? I mean, it's 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 erotic and pleasurable, but it also is allowing people to explore roles they might not have experienced before. Right. Absolutely. And, and you know, I think we have in, in our culture, we have this enculturated equation of things that are pleasurable with things that are trivial. Yeah. Like if something feels good, it can't possibly oh. be. <laughs> obviously that's fake, you know, and obviously a big part of what Woodhull is about is pushing back against that idea. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, when we're talking about ways of really cementing practices into our, into our, into our spirits into our practice. Mm -hmm. um, I think pleasure is a great way of doing that. Yeah. You know, it's it's how we teach our lizard brain, our nervous system, our whole bodies, what is the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and people learn, like, carrots are much better than sticks, unless you like sticks. Um, but, like, people learn through pleasure in our system, and it's like, oh, I was in that role, and it felt good. I got to experience this and, and associate it with my body feeling good so maybe I'm more likely to step into it into other roles as well in other areas of my life right so I think about you know taking a taking a position of intentional and negotiated power during in a in the context of an intimate relationship mm -hmm. and I I learn by doing that how good it feels to care for someone and to give someone the space to allow themselves to take in care mm -hmm. um, and through doing that I, I gain tools for doing that outside of you know the bedroom um, and and expand my capacity to care for the people in my life uh, outside of the context of sex um, and to hold space for the people that I care for to be able to receive that care even when receiving care is hard um, because I practice during this really contained context. Yeah, I love that because I'm, I'm a shy introvert. And so, like, I've had people all my life tell me, you need to be more outgoing. And it's hard to do that. Like, if you haven't embodied that in a safe space, like, the role-playing therapy I did was really powerful for me because I got to step into it very awkwardly without having to fight someone for that space um, and have someone encourage me and I could be awkward at it and I could explore my feelings about it and how I wanted to express. So that, I guess, you know, I'm thinking that might be somewhat analogous. Absolutely. And you know, this is the whole basis for the work of Augusto Boal, who created Theater of the Oppressed. Mm -hmm. um, he was a Brazilian revolutionary, I think. Um, but uh, I could be wrong about, about uh, where he was working, in which case, oh. sorry. Um, but he, he did this, um, this practice called Theater of the Oppressed, where he identified theater as rehearsal for revolution. Mm. Uh, and he would put uh, his actors, he called people, he called participants, spect actors, uh, the, a mix of spectator and actor, mm -hmm. because he said that the barrier between uh, people who are participating with their bodies and people who are participating by watching should be broken down. Mm -hmm. uh, he believed that by putting people in their bodies in the circumstances of role play um, and being able to try out different experiences and different interactions, they could teach their body what it felt like to be uh, in a space of revolution so that when it actually came up, their bodies would know what to do. Um, and I think, I think one of the things that really gets neglected in a lot of the work that we do is, um, is involving the body, right? Thematic learning really gets dropped by the wayside because so much of our work, you know, in, in advocacy is really thinky talking. Yeah. Um, you know, it's stuff you have, you have to be able to do it online. You have to be able to do it on the phone. You know, it so it can't involve somatic processing. Well, we're in our heads. We're just, you know, just visually and auditorily taking stuff in. Right. Um, 
and and I think that neglects a big part of how we learn, mm-hmm. uh, and I think neglects a big part of how we can actually change our own practice in a meaningful way because we can't learn new stuff unless our body learns it too. Yeah, yeah. I have a lot of intellectual. Like I I did therapy for years. Um, I have a sexual abuse history, so I did therapy for years, and I understood my problems really well. But I still had mm-hmm. them, and it wasn't until I started doing more somatic work that. And, and EFT and other techniques that involve more of the body that the, the actual things shifted for me. Absolutely. And I don't just want yeah. to understand these. I, want to, I don't want to understand power dynamics only. I want to be able to be powerful. Right, absolutely. Like I think about, I think about the feeling of safety, mm-hmm. right? How do you know when you're safe? What, what is the feeling in your body of feeling safe? Yeah. Um, and I can, I can say, you know, I'm looking around the room and I, I can see that there are no threats here and I, I know cognitively that I'm safe, yes. but that doesn't mean shit to my fight or flight response. Yeah. You know? And so I have to be able to learn somatically mm-hmm. safety, um, you know, and, and it's important for people to have the opportunity to learn somatic safety because that gives you power to do what you got to do in the world without being constantly overwhelmed by anxiety and trigger. <laughs> So much of this work is so hard, and if you're carrying, trying to carry a ton block on top too, like you can't. Right, and like one way of learning somatic safety um, is by being in a, an intentional and negotiated power relationship where the trust is so great mm-hmm. that when when the person who you're with tells you you're safe, you're being cared for, mm-hmm. I'm going to make sure that nothing hurts you. Your body believes that. Oh, wow. That's beautiful. I love that. What are some like, of the things when you're like, negotiating and, and deciding this with partners, like what are some of the things you need to pay attention to setting this up very consciously? Well, I think, I think there, are, there are a lot of things that really, that really need to come into any negotiated relationship dynamic um, because like the difference between uh, – a DS relationship and a not DS relationship is not that one involves power dynamics and the other doesn't. Because there's always power dynamics. Right. Um, it's just that one involves, you know, a, a, an eroticized power dynamic okay. and the other doesn't or doesn't, you know, isn't conscious of it. Mm-hmm. And so, uh, and so, when negotiating any interaction with any partner. Um, it's really important to think about the ways in which you are prevented from expressing your own needs and boundaries by the things you've experienced in your positionalities in your life. Um, because getting around those, those obstacles doesn't have to be your job alone. Mm-hmm. Um, if you're able to communicate what those obstacles are, then your partner can help hold them for you and help hold your needs and boundaries. Um, you know, with you. Yeah. So it, it's not about uh, it's not about not taking responsibility for your own communication and your own needs and your own boundaries, but rather uh, about recognizing that mutual aid is an important part of personal responsibility. It's not supplanted by personal responsibility. Um, and so, uh, in that, you know, like. When you're negotiating, right, and you and you talk about, you know, well, I have this trigger when this specific, you know, type of circumstance happens, it makes it really impossible for me to say I need things to stop at an mm-hmm. right? You can tell a partner that, and then their care, the care that they take around that, is a kind of uh, of, of of power with, right? It's them supporting your power with theirs. And it's a kind of access intimacy. Mm-hmm. Now, I'm, I'm just going to quick uh, define that term because it's it's not one that's an enormously large usage, which I think it should be it's really cool. Um, it was coined by Mia Mingus, um, who works in the Bay uh, mm-hmm. and does really often transformative justice work. Um, so Mia coined this term to talk about the ways in which uh, supporting your partners or your friends or your loved ones uh, access needs is a form of intimacy. Um, so the the easiest way to explain this that I can think of is that um, you know if I have a partner who has uh, a knee that doesn't work so well and doing stairs a lot is really hard for them, mm-hmm. 
uh, you know, and we live in New York City, you go everywhere on the subway. Um, a, way, a way that I am intimate with them um, is that when we're going somewhere, um, I make sure that we have a route that only uses subway stations with elevators. So that it's not solely on them and they, they're used to most of their life having to be solely responsible for that. Exactly. Um, you know, or, or if I'm having a, a hard brain time and my executive function is just all over the place and I can't get my life together, um, then, uh, you know, then one of my partners can sit down with me and say, okay, here's what we're going to do. We're going to make a to-do list. We're going to break it down into really small pieces. We're going to identify the order that we're going to do stuff in. You know, this is access and this. Yeah, that's and it beautiful. has to be both physical and psychological or, or mental health access. Because we all have uh, days where, I know there's days my brain works really well and there's other days it's on vacation and it didn't tell me. Absolutely. And knowing your partner's or your loved one's access needs yeah. and intentionally caring for them. That's what access intimacy is, mm -hmm. um, and it's my it's my opinion that that's something that that power play can and should be because it's about using negotiated power dynamics to to empower your partner in you know in part by caring for their access needs. So I can say my uh, my making sure that we always have access to an elevator in the subway station is a way of being intimate with my partner. I could also call that service, right? Mm -hmm. I could also call that part of a death relationship, right. you know, and, and these different acts can have different meanings in power relationships in different directions. You know, the same thing can be a, a, a dominant act or a submissive act, depending on who's doing it. Like yeah. it, it's, it's all very fluid, but the important thing is that, about using a critical and thoughtful and compassion-based relationship with relational and, and intentional power to care for each other, care for each other's access needs, care for each other's needs around the oppression that we face in the world, um, and empower each other in our work and in our lives. Mm, I love that. That's really beautiful. Um, I have a question too about like, so we're talking about power being very nuanced and I don't want to put words into your, and you know, like I don't want to describe, so I'm going to share and you can tell me if I'm right or not. But, um, you know, if we're saying power is very nuanced and we're also playing in areas we may not have a lot of skills, um, perfection wouldn't be the model I would apply to that. Is that correct? Like it's okay to be a little awkward and to try stuff out and say, oh, wow, that didn't work well. Or like, I realized that I stepped on, I crossed a boundary and I didn't mean to like, how do you, you know, it is very nuanced. It's very complex when you're dancing there. It can be beautiful, but. But it's high state. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we're, what, what we're doing when we do this stuff is, is tinkering in the exposed wiring of each other's psyches. Yeah. Like this is, this is high, high stakes and high risk stuff. Um, and a big part of caring for each other is, um, is being accountable when things go badly. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, you know, a lot of the culture that I find myself embedded in these days um, is very focused on an expectation of moral purity. Mm. Um, yeah, you can't make mistakes. Never making mistakes, never fucking up, never putting your foot in your mouth, you know, never trying something that goes badly. And, uh, and I, you know, I have opinions about that that I could yell about for 60 years, and we sure don't have time for that. Uh, <laughs> We'd miss one home. That'd be very sad. <laughs> yeah. Um, but, you know, I think about the relationships in my life that make me feel the safest. Mm -hmm. um, the relationships in which I have trust and, and, and I'm held and I hold. Mm -hmm. And that feeling of safety and trust doesn't come from nobody having ever fucked up. Oh, right. is it okay to swear? Yeah, it's totally okay. I swear all the time. <laughs> if they uh, can't handle it, they should not subscribe. <laughs> um, it doesn't. It doesn't come from nobody having ever fucked up. Yeah. It comes from those fuck ups being held and worked through and cared for together. Mm 
Mm-hmm. That deepens um, the rhythm. Like if we're trying to be perfect, or I used to, I grew up trying to be perfect because I thought I had to be, and I was afraid to try anything, and there was no depth to the intimacy with people. Is like because I wasn't only letting you see what I thought was okay for. It, it was very shallow. So absolutely. Um, you know, I, I think about, I've been thinking about this in terms of community also, yeah. um, about like what creates a resilient relationship or a relationship that's able to hold um, pain and conflict and trauma mm-hmm. without breaking. Because I think a lot of the problem that we have right now is that we have relationships and communities that aren't resilient enough to hold pain and conflict There's a and lot trauma. of pain out there and people are doing their best, but yeah, it's hard when things happen. Yeah, well, it's hard when we don't like we're acting as if we have these trusting and intimate relationships with people because we're in what we call community with them when actually that doesn't imply anything about a basis of trust. Right. Um, but I, when I think about what, what characterizes a resilient relationship, it's not, I will never hurt you and I trust you to never hurt me. Right. It's, I love you and I don't want to hurt you. And I trust that you me and don't want to hurt me and I I will not throw you away and I trust you not to throw me away I love that's beautiful and I think that's true I mean it's like that's I've had shallow relationships like I said when I didn't have the resiliency when I was still healing and I needed them to be perfect and they messed up and I, I didn't have the room to say wow you're human I needed them mm-hmm. to be something different and they couldn't be that but I love, like, yeah, we're going to all fuck up, but we're going to show up and try to clean up as much as we can. And we yeah. care about each other. I honestly, like, I have learned more about how to fuck up from DS than from anything else. Really? Um, because th- you have to build so much trust and care to even get in the room. Yeah. I, you know, it has to be very conscious. Right. This isn't true for all DS. Like, a lot... A lot of DS, you know, and a lot of images of DS um, are done. Fifty in Shades. <laughs> They're done in a way that run parallel to systemic power dynamics and abuse, uh, and as such, they're completely unexamined. You know, I, I I don't think it's impossible to be, you know, a straight male dominant person in a way that's ethical. But you don't see it a lot because yeah. really easy when your shit runs parallel to what you've been being taught your whole life to go, yeah, I'm the guy, I'm in charge. Yeah. Well, there's not, and there's not a lot of reason for the average person to examine their privilege or their power because it's everything flows that direction. It's like, yeah, this is how it is. It, it, it's so easy, but like, if you, if you are a man hitting women. And you're not being really thoughtful about what it means to do that in the context of a violently misogynist society. You just hit a man hitting women. It doesn't <laughs> matter if you're wearing leather. Yeah, yeah. Very, but well said. That that's so much of what people think of when they think of DS. Because in my life, it's had such revolutionary impact, and I think it has such incredible potential for marginalized communities learning to give and receive care in a way that is scalable, that's mm. genuinely scalable to larger communities that, you know, I, I, I just, I want it to, I want intentional relationships with power to be understood as something other than uh, Christian Grey, um, because it's, it's yeah. I think it's such important rehearsal for revolution. Yeah, and I really love, I mean, again, prob- not kinky, but like, wow, that's really the power dynamic, the exploration, and the ability to to have that be embodied embodied in sexual and, and just in a safe space where it's conscious and we can both try it out and then talk about it afterwards. That's really powerful, and I, I love that you're sharing about it. Um, I don't know if you have a little more time. I'd love to talk a little bit, like, how do you clean up? How do you, like you're talking about these very nuanced relationships and and power and accountability is very important. Are there some things that you would encourage people to look into if there were, you know, having things in place and understanding how some ways to go forward versus like, Oh my God, I screwed up. And then our our primitive brain is frozen. And we're like, uh, like, and then we're actually not helping the other person who might've been harmed by the process. 
Yeah, I mean, I, I actually, I actually teach a whole class on this called oh. "How to Fuck Up Gracefully." Oh, I love that. So uh, keep an eye out for that at a future Woodhull. Nice. Um, yeah. But, uh, you know, I think one of the big one of the big parts of it is that you have to, like, you. This is gonna sound a little dippy. You ready for something that sounds a little dippy? Yeah. You gotta breathe. Um, I think in many cases, the first time that a person is clued into the fact that something they did was harmful, they panic, and they the thing that they're experiencing is their sense of themselves being attacked mm -hmm. because their experience of themselves is I'm a good person. Good people don't hurt people. Mm -hmm. Therefore, I would never hurt someone. Yeah. And so being told you hurt me feels like being told you're not the person that you thought you were. Your understanding of yourself as a good and kind and caring person is wrong. Well, so many, we put a lot of effort into like, I spend a lot of time thinking about, oh, I think this is okay. I'm not going to hurt someone. But we don't always see all the layers of things that are happening. So, right. Yeah. Right. I think it's in, it's important to recognize that like in anything you're doing at any time, it is possible to step on somebody's shit. Yeah. Uh, and and once you accept that it's just gonna happen, mm -hmm. and it is more important, like yeah, try to try to avoid doing it carelessly. Yeah. Um, you know, but it is more important to learn how to deal with having done it than to. Uh, than to prevent it at all costs because that's how we grow like if no one ever tells you hey that thing you said dumb you're never gonna stop no i want that. people to give me feedback hopefully gently if they can first if i don't hear yeah. it turn up the volume or and some people don't have the if they've already had their toes stepped on 20 times that day and i step on the 21st they may not be that gentle right and like that's fine but also when we're talking about intimate relationships, relationships that are already characterized by a lot of trust, I yeah. think it's different. Yeah. Um, like, you know, if, let, let, let's imagine microaggressions for a second. Mm -hmm. Like, if if I say something that's racist without meaning to, you know, maybe I, I, I use a slur that I didn't know was a slur. Right. And my partner my partner, someone that like I've been building trust with for a long time, that they we have mutual care and, and, and intimacy, mm -hmm. is like, hey, I know that you're someone that doesn't want to say dumb racist shit. Mm -hmm. Like I trust that that's true about mm -hmm. you. And so I thought you might want to know that you just <laughs> said dumb racist shit. <laughs> and I'm you that because I love you and I want you to be able to act in a way that's consistent with your values. Yeah. Right? I, it is, that is something that characterizes a trusting and intimate relationship. Mm -hmm. I can't expect that from strangers. Right. Right? If I don't have trusting and intimate relationships with strangers and feeling entitled to that kind of trust from people that I haven't built that kind of trust with is sense. what would make me a shitty entitled person. Mm -hmm. Right? Like, when when, when white people are like, well, just assume that I have good intentions. You know, why don't you trust me? To people that they don't know and haven't built trust with, mm -hmm. that's a kind of entitlement. Right. Um, but the thing that they're feeling entitled to is the kind of trust and mutual care that can should characterize existing intimate relationships. Mm -hmm. um, and so building a kind of relationship where can transgress you can make mistakes you can try risky things um and you know that there is there is a an aura of trust and care enfolding all of it that means that if something goes wrong if you say something wrong if you hurt your partner that you know you have the resilience to work through it together mm -hmm. like that's that's something you have to intentionally create you can't assume that it's there right off the bat right yeah and and once you have it it just keeps getting stronger and stronger because the more the more trust you create the more trust you can create mm -hmm. you know and that's true in relationships and it's true in communities like once you get to a place where you're able to to 
navigate landmines confidently, right. then think how far you can go. Yeah, that's, and you've learned you've learned how to clean it up together. Like the smaller, hopefully you've had the smaller things before the bigger things, so you have a a pattern and like oh this I, I love the the five languages of apology. The author Gary Chapman's very homophobic, sadly, but the the concept is good. Like different people like to be apologized or or made amends to in different ways. So and you can learn your partner. Yeah, yeah, and and you know I think. Honestly, like I think a lot of what we're dealing with in the way that our communities are like fractured and diffuse is based in people acting as though they're entitled to trust and intimacy that they haven't earned. Mm, I really like that. Yeah, I I, uh, I I can see a lot of places where that I've seen that. And I I don't I don't think that it's you know I don't think that it's a malicious or intentional choice. I think it's because. When we talk about community, we talk about what we want community to be and not what it actually is. Our communities are, there's not a set, like I think people think of this community that's very solid and we're actually a lot of little communities that float together. Well, but actually like when we say, at least in my experience, when we say community, we're talking about like a group of people who have some identity or some activity or some political stance in common Mm -hmm. that share something and that are all in the same place or all doing the same thing because of that one shared identity or oppression or experience or interest or whatever but that doesn't actually imply any sort of relationship between the individuals in that group and so when you have that you've got a group whose boundaries are defined only by the people that are thrown out of the group yes and so we have communities that are not made up of like relationships, but by but that are made up of who haven't we thrown away yet? Mm-hmm. And I prefer not to throw people away. I'll certainly set boundaries with people that are causing harm repeatedly and can't get the. But I prefer much more to bring people up and and have people included. So I don't think that I don't think that it's. I don't think that it's a useful way of thinking about community mm-hmm. uh, because it doesn't imply it doesn't imply trust. But we act as though it does. No, that's a really good point. It is. It's like the only way we know where our the community ends is by who we've kicked out, and then that isn't a trust building thing. And we haven't really built an intimate relationship with all the members in it. But there is that sense of we're a community. We belong together, so I should trust you, and you should trust me. Oh, yeah. Um, I, you've been really generous with your time. I'd love. Would you share why? Why did you choose Woodhull for sharing this topic? It's a great topic. I'm excited about it. You know, I've been going to Woodhull since uh, 2010, I think. Um, and I just I have a lot of affection for it. Um, I think it's it's a really lovely interdisciplinary group that is diverse in specific ways that I don't often see um, and 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 so in in those specific types of diverse now I'm not I'm not to say that the group is always diverse in the in the colloquial understanding of the word um, because it is you know it does tend to skew white it tends to skew um, in a certain age bracket it tends to skew you know in a certain income bracket like that's not what I mean when I say diverse but rather that often we find ourselves talking to the same group of people about mm-hmm. the same stuff. Yeah. Uh, and, and Woodhull is different people than I'm usually talking to about this stuff. Yeah. Um, and I like that. And, um, and I find that it's a really receptive place um, to, to try out new things. So this, this panel that we're doing, um, it's, uh, it's me and uh, and Rue Khan and Kate Diadamo and Ida Mandalay. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, that'll be. Let's. I know I know. Yeah, it's great. It's gonna. And um and we've never we've never done this panel before. This is the first time. Um and we were just you know we were we were a, a bunch of us were I want to be creating change or something you know if we just we do the circuit um, and we were we were hanging out and, and drinking in our hotel room and, and yelling about this stuff, <laughs> uh, yelling about how, uh, you know, how the, the idea of, uh, of intentional power play 
gets so co-opted by um, people who are in positions of hegemonic power and that it's such a different thing when it's done in a liberation oriented way yeah. and how like we were so mad that no one paid attention to that and we were like shit let's go to Woodhull and talk about it that's wonderful I you know thank you for putting this together this is very like for even as somebody who's not kinky I'm like this is going to be such a great talk and I can't wait to hear it you know I gotta I gotta tell you I don't I don't think you have to be so when we, we talk about kinky as an identity, mm -hmm. I feel like it gets it gets really narrowed That's and true. people think if I don't get off on like being hit with a bat, that means I'm not a kinky person. Yeah. Um, I don't actually think you have to be a kinky person in that particular way to benefit from having intentional power relationships. Yeah, and I do um, I can see that because I, I guess I do. I I make kinky mean a certain narrow thing, but I do like that someone tells me, okay, I'm in charge now and we're going to play with that or I can be in charge for a while. And Like if, if you can imagine someone coming to you and saying, okay, so for the next hour, I'm going to take care of you mm. and I'm going to make sure that you're safe and I'm going to, um, I'm going to hold, I'm going to hold you in, in not just a physical way, but you know, my my spirit is going to hold your spirit and you don't have to be scared yeah. in the next hour. That's, that's beautiful. Yeah. I, I would never have thought of that as being in the, in that play, but I can definitely see that. That's, so. that's what I mean when I see power play, um, is finding ways of holding each other that we can actually take in. That's, that's beautiful. Andy, thank you so much. I so appreciate your generosity and, if you're watching this, please sign up for Woodhall and come and see Andy and Ida and Rue. And who else was it? I'm sorry. Hey, Diorama. Hey, Diorama. Yeah, it's going to be a great talk. Thank you so much, Andy. Thank you, Kathy. I'll talk to you soon. Yeah.